panel now called uh, Russia Roadblock to Reset. And we're very happy to have uh, Fred Hyatt, uh, edit editorial page editor of the Washington Post, as our moderator, and a uh, distinguished group of panelists uh, who he will introduce in a minute. Uh, in addition to his, uh, uh, during his, his journalistic uh, career, Fred also um, did a stint in Moscow. So uh, he is a very uh, appropriate moderator, I think, for this session. So I'll turn it over to Fred now and he'll introduce the panelists. Thank you. <coughs> And thank you all for coming. Um, since this panel was scheduled, we've gotten extra news uh, with the Obama administration's decision on missile defense, <coughs> with President Medvedev's recent uh, discussions of democracy, which I assume he did to submit to this conference. Uh, and of course, this week, Medvedev and Obama are planning to meet. So uh, we have extra panelists also, um, <coughs> and uh, including a senior administration <coughs> official who's with us in the audience, uh, who if our panelists on stage do their job and provoke him sufficiently, maybe can be persuaded to make an intervention. <coughs> so to make time for everybody and questions, we've asked everybody to keep their initial presentations um, brief, and I will do the same. Our first speaker will be Lilia Shevsova, uh, as you know, senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Before that, she was deputy director of the Moscow Institute of International Economic and Political Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences and <clears throat> one of the leading commentators on Russian affairs both here and in Russia. Uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman is now a distinguished fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. Um, until recently was Under Secretary of Defense, capping a long distinguished career in the Foreign Service. And Ivan Krastev, uh, who is the chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, Bulgaria, also editor-in-chief of the Bulgarian edition of Foreign Policy and many other illustrious jobs and titles. So the subject is reset, barriers, oh. Barriers to Reset, it's a kind of a pessimistic title they gave us. Um, oh. Lilia, why don't you start off and tell us where we stand. Uh, thank you, Fred. Well, thank you, Bob, for inviting me, for having me. Uh, well, here I would represent a Russian liberal view. And I don't need to remind you that Russian liberal view is uh, in minority. Well, my position is not dominant in the Russian political well, life. So let me start in a very brief way. I will, I will be doing it in a way of brush strokes because we have to pack our initial presentations. So let me start with two assertions and then with several bullet points. My, my first assertion will be the following. Whatever Russian pundits and political leaders are telling outwardly, United States of America and the US-Russian, Russian-US relations are becoming very strong, powerful factors in Russian domestic life. All political forces, political leadership, political elite, constantly appeal to America, constantly address America, what is being said in America, how America is moving, etc., etc., in order to pursue the domestic agenda. So in a sense, we are apparently the country that is very much interested in what is happening in America. Second, second assessment. I believe that President Obama does not need any kind of my defense. But at the same time, I would like uh, 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 commenting on what has been said today earlier, uh, uh, make a conclusion of the following type. Whatever policy current administration or future American administra administration will follow, it may follow the usual real policy. It may change and try to uh, uh, to acquire much more or to use much more deep transformational angle in its policy. Or even revert to what Senator Kyle has suggested to the policy based on the evil Russia stereotype. In any case, the results of the American policy towards Russia will, will, will result, uh, will, will, will end in, I would say, half-hearted, maybe success or even a failure. Why? due to the fact that Russia has a system that it has, unless the system is restructured. And now very briefly, um, several comments on, on the major impediments or roadblocks 
to their research policy seen from the domestic Russian liberal perspective. The first impediment or roadblock is different understanding in Washington and in Moscow of the research policy. As far as I feel, I may be mistaken, as far as I feel in Washington, the research policy is first of all the tool, the, ins the instrument to achieve other goals, Iran, Iraq, etc. In Moscow, the research policy is viewed as the means, very important means to return to real or virtual bipolarity and to strengthen the Russia's leverage, prestige, and superpower status. And in the end, to strengthen one of the most important pillars of the Russian anti-Western system. And the Russian political elite said, we don't need any research. This research policy and mistakes should be corrected from the American side. So Russia is not, at the moment, uh, is not even undertaken any kind of research agenda. Second, import, uh, uh, second obstacle or, uh, or, or roadblock. <clears throat> Uh, this roadblock is connected with the way Russia is structured and Russia is organized and ruled. And I'm not going to repeat uh, here the truism about the value gap. Uh, this is not the problem of the value gap. This is not a problem even of Russia's continued imperialistic nostalgia or urge or longings, although they do exist. The problem is much more complicated and nuanced. The problem is that Russia, on the one hand, has returned to its traditional matrix, to its traditional paradigm of survival, which includes personalized power, which is endorsed by uh, superpower status, by constant permanent search for an enemy, by desire to have areas of privileged interest, and of course, uh, by, by the attempt uh, to use the new 21st century instrument. And at the same time, the model of the old <coughs> matrix is updated. That's the major problem, which creates a lot of difficulties for understanding and for the response. Is updated because the Russian political elite is longing to be personally incorporated into the Western society, into the Western framework, into the Western political and business connections. And the way Russia survives now is to be with the West and to be against the West at the same time. That means that, well, that, that, that formula, in fact, well, uh, reflects the duality of thinking, behaving, of living of the Russian political class that wants to be in the West, to, to have kids in the Western schools, to keep accounts in the Western banks, well, to, to collaborate with Western politicians, to be a part of the G8, and at the same time to close Russia for the West. And hence those absolute, absolutely schizophrenic examples of the Russian behavior and, and, uh, and role in the world. On the one hand, Russia is part of the G8. On the other hand, a Russian political elite view the American elite as the foe, as the enemy. On the one hand, Russia is part of the, uh, of the Russian, uh, NATO Russia Council, and at the same time, Russia views NATO as one of the major, of the major, uh, of the major uh, hostile forces. And so this, this ambiguity, this hybrid nature of the Russian political elite survival makes very difficult response to Russia, makes very difficult, well, sometimes impossible, search of any effective paradigm of dealing with Russia. And this brings me to the third impediment. The Western, policy, uh, the Western policy towards Russia, Western and American response towards Russia. At least until recently, the Western policy, including American policy, uh, could fit uh, the dichotomy, either engagement or containment, either democracy promotion or, mm, or real politics. And neither pattern has been successful. The attempts to promote, to help Russia to promote democracy, uh, to, 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 to proceed with, uh, with um, a liberal transformation in the 90s, ended, as we remember, with endorsement and support of Yeltsin's regime, hardly democratic regime. And recent realpolitik, and I believe that Tom Karabas of Carnegie Endowment <coughs> is right, 
when he said that Bush administration, administration, administration ne never, never used uh, the word, it seems to me it was Mike McCall who was the first uh, to, to write about it, that Bush never has used the word de dealing with President Putin. Am I right, quoting you, Mike? Oh, you don't remember. Uh, well, in any case, in any case, in any case, uh, the Bush policy, viewed from the Russian domestic perspective, allows me to make the conclusion that uh, the Bush administration politics towards Russia was based on the Rav political conviction. And where we found ourselves in the end of Bush era and end of Putin uh, presidency. And. Uh, uh, let, let me add uh, to these several cliches that have been quite popular. Well, uh, I'm not sure that the cliche, let's return back, cliche that has been uh, mentioned by, um, by Senator Kyle is still very popular in the Washington political milieu. Uh, let's return to, to the policy based on Russia, the evil empire stereotype. I'm not sure that this is popular anymore. But, uh, you know, seriously, I'm not sure that policy based on this stereotype could be feasible. But even if Americans try to pursue this policy, then they will need somehow to deal with the American and Western politicians, pundits, and <coughs> business people that have been incorporated into, the, uh, into Russian political, commercial, business activities. Then you have to deal with Mr. Schroeder, who is representing Gazprom and a lot of other Western politicians, including the former uh, NATO uh, general secretaries who are working for Russian companies. Then you have to deal with American lobbies that are quite powerful in Washington and who are lobbying the Russian interests. Then you have to deal with American institutions, universities, Library of Congress, uh, think tanks that are getting Russian sponsorship. So I just, I can't imagine how the policy, uh, policy based on the stereotype, stereotype, uh, stereotype Russia is evil uh, could be pursued currently uh, by the United States. But of course, uh, much more popular from what I see are the stereotypes of real politique. Just mention, I will mention several of them. Take Russia as it is. Russia is not mature for democracy. Well, um, let's pursue our common interests and common threats with Russia? Well, overall, we apparently need to raise the question why the Russian political elite loves real politics so much. Because those stereotypes, and especially George Cannon, that is constantly quoted by the American realist pundits, will serve sometimes as justification or part of the protection doctrine that is used so often by the Russian political elite. And uh, uh, you can ask me a question, well, uh, whether we in Russia in Moscow find anyone in the American political class, uh, on, the, on the American political scene, who is apparently suggesting the recipes that are viewed by us as helpful for Russian transformation. I will mention several names. Firstly, I believe that one of the reports published in 2006 by the Council of Foreign Relations, edited as far as I remember by Steve Sestani, it was one of the first attempts to find a combined multidimensional approach to Russia, value-based approach, and pragmatism. Several other attempts have been made, uh, including by Fran Fukuyama, who is thinking about paradigm based on realist Wilsonianism, by uh, Bob Kagan, by the way, who is trying to find new approaches uh, to respond to the to the to the, mm, to the activization of the world authoritarianism by Brzezinski in his article in the Financial Times where he suggested President Obama to combine not only engagement, 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 but also creation of the stimulus for Russia's transformation. And mention, <coughs> I would mention also the articles of David Kramer who's sitting somewhere in the audience who's trying to find a new combination of several dimensions uh, uh, with, respect, with respect to Russia. And two points, one point. What we, a Russian liberal, would expect from the American administration that could help not only our own survival 
in our ghetto, but strategically would help Russia. Well, I would say we would like to have in the American policy a kind of a triad. Firstly, definitely engagement. Engagement and creation of the conditions for Russia, for Russia's entry in the WTO, for Russia's joining OECD, but of course not at the expense of other and not at the expense of facilitating or rejecting the rules of the game. Secondly, we would like the, America, the, Amer the United States of America and the West to create a number of stimulus and um, international environment which could be conducive, benevolent for Russia's transformation. And one of the most important stimulus would be apparently the success of the independent state, transformation of Ukraine, of Belarus, of Moldova, of Georgia, because the demonstration of the Ukrainian success would be a great stimulus and impetus for the Russian transformation. And thirdly, yes, thirdly, I will, be, I will use this, the word that I don't like. I will use the, way, the word containment. Containment of the traditional part of the Russian elite. But uh, I, I, I frankly believe that uh, any kind of formula, any kind of recipe will not work. It will work only under one condition if Americans and Europeans could come together and, consolid and produce consolidated strategy. Without that, any, even the most brilliant reset policy that is formed by the brilliant people who understand the idea of democracy promotion in Washington hardly <coughs> can be successful. And there are two, uh, two <coughs> very uh, brief points at the end. I believe that despite of my pessimistic view of the U.S.-Russian-Russian-American relations, despite of my pessimism with uh, respect to any formula of the American policy towards Russia, <coughs> if Russia remains unchanged, there is a, at least uh, one, glimpse of, uh, one, one glimpse, a glimpse of optimism. And my optimism <coughs> is related to the fact that for the first time in Russia's history, Russian population is much more ready for democracy, for independent institutions, for new rules of the game. 68% of Russians now vote, well, think at least, think, uh, think about priority and uh, uh, priority of, of, democratic, of democratic institutions, and they support democratic values. <coughs> 43% of Russians, can you imagine, still, despite of this anti-American propaganda, every day in anti-American Propaganda, 43% of Russians still view the United States as benevolent country. 72% view the European Union as benevolent uh, entity. And uh, besides 42, 42.5% of representatives of the Russian elite, of the second echelon, deputy minister, they believe that the current system in Russia is outdated. So we have to move over. So Russia is more mature for democracy than many think. So what's the problem? The problem is the elite, which is incorporated in the personal capacity into the West. And secondly, for the first time in Russia's history, the external factor, the behavior of the West and first of all of the United States of America could have absolutely a powerful, um, strong, uh, strong influence on what is happening within the country. The question is whether the United States and the West in general will use this unique historic opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I think it was very interesting. I stopped listening when you said this can work only if Europe and the United States come together. <laughs> but uh, no, a, a lot of uh, food for thought. Let me turn quickly to Eric and then uh, maybe we can turn to Mike. Well, <clears throat> my task, um, after hearing Lilia's uh, uh, quite uh, broad tour de raison, is much more narrow. <clears throat> I was asked to uh, comment on the impact of the uh, decisions last week by the Obama administration on the third European missile site uh, on the effect on, on reset of relations with Russia. And the difficulty is, of course, that uh, everybody in the administration is busy denying that this had anything to do with reset uh, with Russia. Secretary Gates was at great pains to say that in his uh, press conference last uh, Thursday announcing uh, the decisions. Um, uh, both he 
uh, and Secretary Clinton have been uh, out with op-eds in the New York Times and Financial Times respectively yesterday and today uh, making, making the same point. Um, but it's unfortunately uh, very hard to square that uh, both with, and I should say that I have enormous respect for Secretary Gates. I worked by his side for a couple of years. I think he's arguably one of the greatest secretaries of defense ever, if not the greatest. And I actually believe that he did not do anything uh, in this area having uh, to do with an expectation that this might help reset relations with Russia because of the experiences uh, he and I shared. But that being said, it is very hard to square this with the backgrounding being done by uh, many members of the administration, by the context in which the decision was made, and in any event, uh, nobody in Europe or Russia believes it. Um, everybody thinks it was about uh, Russia, and, and that's a reality that will have to be dealt with. <clears throat> there probably was no issue, at least during the time I served in government, uh, other than perhaps NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine, that appeared to have been uh, such a big bone in Russia's throat than the decision to put the ground-based interceptors in Poland and the associated radar in the Czech Republic. And it's always been a little bit difficult uh, for me to understand uh, that, that Russian point of view. On the one hand, President Putin told President Bush repeatedly, uh, and Sergei Ivanov repeated to Secretary Gates on, numer on at least one occasion, I think others, uh, that uh, Iran was the greatest strategic threat that Russia faced. And if that were true, uh, given the amazing efforts that were made, um, both before the decision was made um, in uh, January 2007 and afterwards, to try and meet Russian objective objections, uh, it's hard to understand and square that uh, a statement about Russia's national interest with the response which we got. Before the decision was made, my then colleague, the Undersecretary for Intelligence, Steve Cambone, and the Missile Defense Agency Director in those days, General Trey Obering, uh, went to Moscow at Secretary Rumsfeld's request uh, to meet with the then Minister of Defense uh, Sergei, and Deputy Prime Minister uh, Sergei Ivanov and General Balayevsky, the then Chief of Defense, now Secretary of the National Security Council. Uh, and explained in painful detail uh, why the technical parameters of the system we were proposing to uh, deploy did not have the capability to intercept Russian IB ICBMs uh, from their location in Poland, but uh, that if we placed them somewhere else in Europe, perhaps the United Kingdom, uh, they would have at least a technical capability of catching at least a few Russian ICBMs, although that was clearly not our intent. The Russian response then and subsequently was always the same. That's very interesting. Thank you for the information. We would prefer you put the interceptors in the United Kingdom. I think this actually uh, demonstrates that the objection Russia had was not about physics um, and trajectories of missiles, but about geography and, and where they were placed, and that it really was an objection rooted in what Lilia called uh, uh, post-imperial nostalgia. The grievance, like the grievance that Russia expressed on CFE, seemed absolutely impervious to being assuaged. No, man, no matter how many times on CFE, my colleague Dan Freed tried to meet Russian objections, coming up with one creative solution after another, they were all rejected. Uh, on missile defense, uh, this was always a little bit perplexing. I mean, after all, the Russian objection uh, seemed hard to fathom, given the fact that we we're talking about 10 interceptors. Given the fact that Russia has already deployed its own missile defense interceptors, the Gorgon and Gazelle missiles around Moscow that are not uh, armed by the that are armed by the way with a nuclear warhead, unlike the missiles that we were proposing to put in, which not only had no nuclear warhead, they had no explosive warhead, they had no warhead. They were purely uh, kinetic inter interceptor uh, interceptors that destroyed missiles with the force of a collision um, at high speeds in outer space. Russia also has radars that peer deep into Europe and into the Atlantic, which never seemed to be the occasion for any complaint from Europe or uh, the United States, but somehow this, uh, ra this radar in the Czech Republic, which was not an early warning radar, by the way, um, uh, was a, a matter of, of, of great concern. During the course of many meetings, and I was in both meetings of the two plus two with Secretaries Gates and Secretary Rice, as was David Kramer, who's here in the audience, um, in uh, additional meetings, uh, in Secretary Gates' meeting with uh, then President Putin uh, before the two plus twos got launched, uh, we provided a series of uh, non-papers and briefings. I, if, I, if my memory is correct, I think there were a total of five non-papers and briefing, offering uh, various forms of missile defense cooperation with Russia against a common threat uh, in, um, in uh, 
in, in Iran in the form of the Iranian missile, um, and uh, showing how Russia's existing missile defense technology could be linked together with NATO's to provide a common European uh, defense. Uh, as uh, former Secretary uh, of State Henry Kissinger has said, I can think of no more compelling uh, strategic decision that Russia could have taken to deal with the Iranian problem than to have joined with us in, in a common effort on, on uh, missile defense. Uh, and it, it was not to be, alas. Um, so where are we now given the administration's uh, decisions? Um, I am uh, fearful about the impact this will have uh, on the balance of forces inside Russia. It seems to me that those who have argued uh, for a tough anti-American position are going to feel vindicated from this. Uh, and therefore, I, I don't anticipate much lessening of Russia's objections uh, to various uh, uh, US policies or any help on Iran. Uh, I think we've already seen that in the comments that uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov made before the decision, where he said, look, if the Americans decide to change course on missile defense, that's purely a uh, correction uh, or rectification of a mistake made by America in the past. It's not a concession to Russia, and we have no intention of paying for it. Ergo, don't expect us to do anything as a result of this. Uh, the first statements that came from Prime Minister Putin were, this is a good concession. We hope there'll be more concessions, particularly on WTO, which is a little bit uh, odd because it was, from my understanding anyway, President Putin who withdrew Russia's application for membership in the WTO. Um, the only uh, uh, response we've seen so far is an ambiguous one on the question of whether or not Russia will now deploy Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad, missiles that were used offensively against Georgia, I might add, in August 2008. Um, so uh, we will see. There have been some statements that they might be withdrawn, but I've seen others now that cast <coughs> doubt on that. We'll just have to see whether that uh, makes a difference. My fear is that what we will see is uh, a encouragement of Russia to push harder and demand more in the post-start negotiations um, with the United States, in particular linking uh, offensive reductions in, in nuclear arms to missile defense, uh, putting more constraints on our long-range precision uh, conventional strike capabilities, uh, including uh, trying to capture any future U.S. bomber. I know Secretary Gates has just made the announcement of a potential future U.S. bomber. I think if uh, if the current administration's experience is anything like what Paula de Sutter had uh, in her discussions, uh, they will find that the Russians are trying to use the kind of start counting rules to accomplish precisely these three objectives. If Russia succeeds, I think what it will mean is a agreement, if one, if one eventuates, that will not be ratifiable by the United States Senate. Thank you, Eric. <coughs> Very interesting talk. Um, I think I will now uh, use the prerogative of the chair to ask Ivan to hold so that he can wrap everything up for us. Uh, we have uh, here Mike McFall, who uh, most of you know, uh, a former colleague of Lilia at Carnegie, professor at Stanford University, and now senior director for Russia at the National Security Council. Um, Mike, a, a couple things I'm sure people would like to hear your thoughts on. We heard. Lilia say that uh, reset has limited potential because the Russians don't see any need to reset their own policy. <clears throat> and we've heard Eric say that uh, whatever the actual motivations of uh, the administration's decision last week, it will be seen in Russia and Central Europe as a concession and it will embolden the anti-American forces. Uh, maybe you could respond to those points. Yeah. And Yvonne, I apologize. No, no, wrapping up is something that Central Europe believes in. <laughs> <laughs> Can people hear? I do apologize to speak and run. I have to go engage uh, Mr. Shuvalov about WTO literally at 3.30. So that's Mike, do you want to come up? And All right, I'll, I'll just be calm and brief. I'll be happy. <laughs> have a seat. <coughs> Steve, you only have 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would just say a couple of things in reaction. Um, Lilia, I think, has right what we're trying to do with one exception. The notion of engagement, 
uh, I would add engagement, in the way we talk about it, is engagement of your government, but also your society. That's a very deliberative uh, uh, decision we made. And when we went to Moscow, just to remind you, we spent day one with your government, and we spent day one, two, with the exception of a breakfast with Prime Minister Putin, mm -hmm. the entire day with society in Russia. And I, I think people don't, uh, I, I dare you to think of another summit, including the one in 1988, Ronald Reagan's very famous summit, where a president spent so much time with Russian society. Just to remind you, he gave a speech at the New Economics School that was deliberate to speak to the youth, a school created by Western money, by the way. Uh, he then went to a business forum to speak to uh, American and Russian businesses. He then went to a civil society forum uh, to speak to civil society, and he ended his day speaking with the Russian opposition, the people most hated by your government. That, were ch that was the criteria that's to get in the meeting, by the way. Yeah. Uh, who they did not want, uh, and we had a big fuss about it, by the way, where to meet and all that. That's what we did. Um, by the way, uh, Medvedev seems to be taking a playbook out of our, our book. He's coming here, as you probably know, I think tomorrow night. He's going to give a talk to university students in Pittsburgh. He's going to meet with dissidents. Maybe, maybe Bob Kagan, if you know, I think about it. Uh, yeah, he said he's coming to meet with dissidents. He's going to give a big speech. Uh, and, and, you know, this parallel structure. And, and we think that's great. So, so we're doing that for sure. Second, success in the, in, in the country's border. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly the strategy. What you said is exactly what Vice President Biden said when he went to Kiev and Tbilisi. And, and, and the success of Ukraine and Georgia is a very big part of what we're trying to do inside your country. That's just a statement of fact. Uh, the, whether we succeed or not, that's, uh, you know, let's judge that later, but that is the strategy. The, the part that's not, and this will get me to Eric's comments, is the third part of a little bit of containment, right? You know, the kind of, let's do all those things and then contain Russians uh, elsewhere. We, for better or for worse, uh, that's, that's not what we're doing. Rather, I would put it this way, that we're, to quote Dan Freed, uh, we're, we're pursuing our interests with the Russians where we can, and pursuing our interests without the Russians when we have to. And so when I think of Manas, when I think of the agreement that Mr. Burdi Mukhamedi from Turkmenistan pledged to put uh, gas into Nabucco, when I even think of missile defense, I'm gonna get to that in a minute, those are instances where we're pursuing what we think to be in our national interest, not with necessarily with or without Russia. And, and it's very, I mean, if you read Obama's speech, and, and again, whether it's good strategy or bad strategy, we're gonna judge, you know, four to, or eight years from now, and I, and I welcome the opportunity. But what I want to make sure is that we, you at least understand what, what I think we're trying to do. And I take the point that, you know, we have, you know, we, this is not a totalitarian dictatorship and we don't have a message, I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Um, um, what we're trying to do is to say, these are what we're, these are our interests. And, and in Moscow, he had five of them. Uh, tomorrow, he'll also lay out the, the pillars of what we're trying to do in the world. And the coda to all those are, we don't see in pursuing policy X, why it's not in Russia's interest. Uh, that's the strategy. Um, and in some places, we have a fundamental disagreement. Where are the borders of the state of Georgia? We have a fundamental disagreement. But, but I would say that, that's the strategy. It's not neo-containment. And it could be naive. I, I, I accept that fact. It, we could be, it could be an uh, ill-suited Ill strategy for dealing with this, this nasty Russian bear. And the last thing I would say on this, in, in the spirit of uh, you know, understand the policy, but I appreciate the skepticism. Uh, Obama will, has said in Moscow, and he consistently says, he uses this jargon from political science, we are looking for win-win opportunities. He says that about all countries, but most certainly about Russia. Non-zero sum. Uh, Russia, as you all know better than I, uh, Russian elites tend to think in zero sum terms. And that is a fundamental difference. That's not about values necessarily. I think it is related to it, right? That's a fundamental disagreement we have. And uh, I would just say, in conclusion, at you know, up month uh, eight in the administration or nine or where we're at, uh, to not, we, we are uh, testing the possibility that the notion that there is a uniform, uh, single way to think about foreign policy from a Russian perspective is not true. That's what we're trying to do. So in some places, is it zero sum? Absolutely. And will it remain that way for eight years? Absolutely, I have no doubt. But are there other instances, are there other issues where uh, we can think in non-zero sum terms? And that's, that's the game, that's what we're, we're seeking. 
Now, my own view, just so we're all clear about this, and I want to emphasize, this is my personal view. I know a lot of people here, when I hear we're naive about Russia, I say, you know, I say that to my face, please. Uh, my personal view is I, I'm skeptical whether it's going to work, right? And, and so let's, let's, among friends, come on. Uh, I, I, it's a healthy skepticism. That's me as an analytic, you know, professor, you know, colleague at Carnegie. My response as a policymaker, what is the alternative to what we're doing? And what I think I heard you talking about, containment and evil Russia and going back to that, my response to that is, man, we don't have the bandwidth to have another enemy uh, to deal with, given the real enemies that we have in the world right now. So, that, I, so it's not out of naivete that we're doing what we're doing, I guess. It's out of, uh, of a conviction that I haven't yet, I've yet to see, you know, and I know these other arguments of, you know, little, a little containment here, a little containment there, Steve races. I, I just don't think it's a real viable alternative strategy. So that's on the big stuff. On missile defense, um, just a couple of things I would say here. Uh, it is true. I, I've been in every single meeting with the Russians at highest levels to the lowest levels in every single meeting of the U.S. government on this issue. I have. I, believe me when I say that when the issue is raised, and some people did raise it, well, what if we did this for them? What could we get for them? I would stand up and say, we're not doing it that way. Because we're going to do it in our national interest. If it has advantage, you know, if it works to, to, to help us with Russia on other issues, that's fine. But, but believe me, Secretary Gates was always the guy saying it much more forcefully than me. And you know it better than anybody. There is no way in hell, and, and he is not just some, some guy that you're just going to roll over with some, you know, senior associate that, you know, low-level bureaucrat at the NSC is going to tell uh, Secretary Gates that we, we need to trade this to the Russians? Give me a break. Come on. That, that is not the Secretary Gates that I've had the pleasure of working with. He just doesn't think that way. If anything, to let, you know, he's looking for other ways to, to poke it in their eyes. The real issue, I think, and we can, I, you guys can talk about the technical stuff later, but I have to tell you as an outsider, what's strange to me is that in 2006, when we were doing all these, when you guys went through, why there wasn't the program of record that we are now proposing. Because it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to think that the Iranians would develop a short range ballistic missile first, before they would develop a medium range, before they develop an intermediate range, before they would develop an ICBM. That, that, and that's exactly the way they've done it. And most countries have, by the way. So my question back to you, Eric, is, is why you weren't taking care of that other threat first. And my guess is, having read all those things you're re uh, referring to, is that fundamentally, and this is just a disagreement in policy, fundamentally, the program of record of the Bush administration was about the defense of the United States of America. It was to defend against an ICBM. And two or three, uh, combined with the GBIs that we have in Alaska and California, to take care of it, to have two shots at an ICBM coming at the United States. Because if it wasn't, the Iranians already have hundreds of short-range ballistic missiles right now. So if you're, if you're going to defend anybody against them, you're not going to do it with 10 GBIs in Poland. I just, so, you know, that to me is mysterious. Now, whether, you know, it should be there or it shouldn't be there, or where we get in the year 2020, uh, that, that we're on the physics, and I'm, I'm going to get to the geography in a minute. But that, to me, it just, I agree here with Secretary Gates. This is the threat that's here, and we're dealing with that one, not the one that they may or may not have in the year 2018 against us. And that may be a dis that may be a mistake, by the way. We're defending Europe now. We're not just defending the United States. Uh, the other program did not defend Europe. Uh, whether that was good or bad, whether the Europeans want it or not, uh, hopefully Yvonne will tell you. I'm not sure they do, by the way. Uh, so he'll be able to tell you when I walk out. But that that's a fundamental policy de decision that's different. Um, on the geography, I just got to say, we if if the Russians don't like having our missiles in the former Warsaw Pact countries, they're going to hate this program. Let's just be honest about this. This, <laughs> in the first place that we went and asked if they wanted to base the SM3s was not the UK and was not Paris and was not Iceland or Greenland, it was Poland. And, and there are other countries, uh, Yvonne, even your country, where when we get into when, we, you know, we haven't got there yet, uh, we're going to have hundreds of missiles in the Warsaw Pact at the end of this program, which is about the time, by the way, <coughs> that 10 GBIs were going to show up in Poland, just to be clear about the timing. 
the last thing I'd say um, on the, the, the geography and the politics is, uh, you know, my own view, could we have done this better? Absolutely. In terms of the rollout and, and the, you know, the, the perceptions, which I totally agree with you, Eric, both in Russia and in Eastern Europe, I, uh, those are, that's a statement of fact that those perceptions are there. I, I would say those that know the facts need to fight those misperceptions, uh, and I, I, that's why I'm here, right? Uh, if, if you believe they're true, then you should say they're true, but if they're misperceptions, then let's call them misperceptions and correct the record. That's my view. Uh, but did we blow it on that? Absolutely. I, I agree. Now, was it tied to this, you know, this meeting next week? Absolutely not with the Russians. Because any time you would have rolled this out, we had the same debate in June. Well, if you do it now, you're, it's going to be before Moscow. Well, if you do it in November, it's right before that START treaty, and it's going to look, the Lincoln senators are going to go ballistic. I guess they did upstairs uh, already, right? Uh, you're you're going to have that problem no matter what on the Russian side. So I just said, just do it the right way when we're ready. Uh, but the last thing I'll just end on, we didn't do it that way because we don't live in a totalitarian dictatorship. Because there were leaks, and there was a big Wall Street Journal article that you all know about, and there was a decision to roll this out quicker than we had planned to do it. Now, you know, you be the judge. Uh, you sat there before. You know how this works, Eric. That was a, that, you know, whether we should have jumped the gun or not, that, you know, that's a serious issue. I take that issue in terms of the perceptions being flawed. But the program... Uh, I think is, is rather, uh, you know, defensible, and, and I think it's actually a lot better. Um, and with that, I'm going to let Yvonne tell me why I'm wrong in my absence. All right, see you later. Thank you, Mike. Mike, thank you very much. Um, okay, I'd, I'd like to let Yvonne uh, tell us why he's wrong. I'd like to give Eric an, a minute to respond specifically to the point that Mike made about the architecture of the previous system, and hopefully still have some time for questions. So thank you for being so patient. Yeah, no, but probably Eric should uh, respond immediately because people just okay. have been following this. Quick, resp uh, quick response. Ivan, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, a couple of things. One, uh, I agree with Mike that if the SM3 Block 2, which is part of this administration's new plan of record to deal with a long-range threat, uh, turns out to be a capable system against ICBMs and having hundreds of them spread throughout Europe, it will be infinitely more provocative to Russia than what we intended to do in the Bush administration. Um, I find it somewhat ironic that one of the criticisms leveled against the uh, proposal we had was that the uh, ground-based interceptor in a two-stage variant had not been tested. The SM3 Block 2 not only hasn't been tested, it doesn't exist. It's, it's not uh, a, a real missile, it's a total paper missile in the, in the design stage, not even in the design stage, it's in the conceptual stage. On the specific point of the architecture, um, we had a view that uh, A, it was not a good thing for the United States of America to have a defense against ballistic missiles and our allies not. And the uh, system that had been deployed, the rudimentary capability at Fort Greeley and uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base, gave us the ability to defend uh, continental United States against an Iranian long-range threat. Uh, Europe had no comparable capability. In 2002, the alliance at the Prague summit had concluded that there was a missile threat to Europe and that missile defense was a technologically feasible response to that threat. But if we had um, Yap de Hoopskeffer here today and we put him on sodium pentothal, or, or we, in, you know, we, we subjected him to enhanced interrogation techniques. Actually, I don't even think we would have to do that. I think he would uh, tell you that between 2002 and 2007, almost nothing happened in Europe on missile defense. Once the Bush administration decision was made, we got a lot of movement on, on the uh, defense against the short and medium range threat because the idea was to have Europe step forward and provide the short and medium range defense using MEADS, PAC-3, THAAD, and bolt on to the long-range capability that the U.S., Poland, Czech Republic, Denmark, and the U.K. were providing uh, to uh, defend against the long-range threat, providing an integrated, layered defense against the short, medium, and long-range threat, and providing the ancillary benefit, as Mike said, of also providing additional coverage and defense of the United States, providing us with a a shoot-look-shoot shoot capability against an Iranian missile. I'm not, I, I don't think anybody, at least I don't feel, I have anything to apologize for that. Defending the United States of America is what taxpayers pay the Department of Defense to do. 
So uh, to me, uh, if the administration really had intended to provide more coverage, they could put Aegis uh, SM3 in place now while the ground-based interceptors are, are going in. What they have done is severed the link between Europe's defense and the United States' defense and relieved any obligation from Europeans to defend themselves. Because obviously, if the United States is going to step in and take care of the short and medium range threat, it stands to reason Europeans will think that when the long range threat eventuates, they'll do that too. And therefore, any stimulus or impetus to Europe to defend itself has been removed by the administration's decision. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, I do believe it was General MacArthur who once said, we are not retreating, we're simply advancing in a different direction. Uh, so from this point of view, I do believe it's important to decide what we're doing. I'm just going to touch on three things very quickly. One is, and I'll start with missile defense because I'm not expert on this. I'm just going to talk on perceptions. I'm a representative of a country that was not covered by the Bush missile shield, Bulgaria. Does it mean that we believe that we are betrayed? No because we believe that Article 5 still functions. And I'm afraid that all this discussion is eroding even more the guarantees that are given by Article 5. So I do believe it was mishandled, and the way Poland and the Czech Republic have been treated from the PR point of view and from the emotional point of view is simply stupid. This cannot be done on September 17, full stop. You can done it on 18, 19, 20. This is, this is something not to be discussed. At the same time, I do believe that in the United States there is a strongly kind of misperception also about certain political dynamics and dynamic of the public opinion in Eastern Europe. And knowing that this is not in our interest, but kind of for the honesty of the debate I should tell you this. You should know that in both Poland and the Czech Republic this system were very much unpopular. Public opinion was against them. Mm -hmm. There was a politician that had been basically forcing for this. So this is why part of the bitterness come from the fact that there was a kind of a decision being once unilaterally enforced and after that uni unilaterally scrapped. If the Polish Prime, uh, Prime Minister and the Czech Prime Minister had been invited here and if this was going to be announced on the meeting with them, I was going to be fine. Because this is what in a certain way hurt a lot Central and East Europeans. Secondly, if you go on the public opinion polls and from this point of view, transatlantic trends of the GMF are very important. You're going to see that support for Afghanistan, for the mission in Iraq, and also the threat in Iran are very low in Eastern Europe. Because of provincialism, not of anything else, Eastern Europe is not as a natural allies as many expect in this city. I'm saying this because I do believe we make also disfavor to our own countries, not telling the full story of it, and trying to present and to please the American public to hear what they want to hear. And from this, I'm going to push to reset. First of all, I was very happy to see that basically people here agree or disagree with reset policy because the major problem in Europe is we still don't know what a reset policy is. And we are always very suspicious when you have a computer metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I'm saying this even not so as a joke because in a certain way, I'm just going to tell you what are the four or five assumptions that we're reading behind it and after that I'm going to present just in a sentence four or five concerns that personally I have. The first assumption behind the reset policy in the way I see it is the following. Obviously Russia is in a kind of a deep struggle to sustain its great power status. For the first 10 years after 1991, it was done much more in a cooperation with the US. Now this is much more in opposing the US to the extent that nevertheless, that by its interest, it's a pro-status quo power, they start to play as a spoiler at large. They're pursuing certain policies, not because this is in their interest, but because they do believe this is going to keep their status. The way I understand, basically, the policy of the current administration is, let's allow the Russians to keep their status through us and not against us. This is fine for me. At the same time, concerning the nature of the regime, they know that this regime is authoritarian, but without soft power, much more kleptocratic. And from this point of view, this is not the paper edition of the Soviet Union because there is no ideology that can export. By the way, the real soft power of Russia these days is corruption and things basically that infiltrating different countries. But this is different thing to be contained because in order to contain them, you're going basically to go to the very principle of the open market and open political system. 
The third important thing is to believe that Medvedev is an opening and that there is a difference between Medvedev and Putin. My position on this is the following. I'm sure that there is a Medvedev camp and that there is a Putin camp. What I don't know is, is Medvedev part of the Medvedev camp? <laughs> but, no, no, but nevertheless, I do believe it's a reasonable policy. And just to give one argument, which uh, is very much in favor of what Mike was saying, recently, one of the young, uh, one of the Russian officials, the uh, director of the agency for use, had been preparing uh, the youth activists for meeting with Mr. Putin. And he gave them the several words that they should not use in this meeting. And the words were money, decline, Medvedev, and president. Uh, so from this point of view, probably there are not major difference between Putin and Medvedev, but obviously there is a certain irritation, and I do believe it's logical to try to play on it. Uh, the last thing that I basically see is, and this is important, is that playing this game, the United States really are also going to fit to some of the expectation of West Europeans, but even East Europeans, because otherwise there was a kind of a misplay between European policies and uh, American policies. So this is fine. From this point of view, I want to say that some of the assumptions are working. Here's where my concerns are. First, it's very much about perceptions, and I very much refer to Lilia because she knows the place much, much better than me. One of the problems is not simply to talk about values and interests, but also to try to understand the references, the analogies through which the policymakers think. And here is the bad news. From the point of view of the Americans who support him, Mr. Obama looks like Kennedy. From Americans who does not like him, like Carter. But for the Russians, he looks very much like Mr. Gorbachev. Somebody who is very popular, who basically is much more popular abroad than at home, but which was much more kind of signal for the weakness and decline than of strengths. The assumptions of decline, relative decline of the American power is the basic assumptions of the Russian policy. And this is why this otherwise reasonable policy is going to be tested all the time. And this is why if, Mr., uh, if Obama administration is interested to succeed, they should show that this is much more part of a common interest than simply not a weakness. The second problem comes for the Europeans. What we struggle with is the fact that the United States started to talk with Russia as a global power, and Russia really is a pro-status quo global power, but in Europe and especially in the neighborhood, Russia is a revisionist power. And the European Union does not feel self-confident to deal with Russia exactly there. What we see from the reset policy is the message, guys, we're doing the nukes and you're going to do Ukraine and Georgia. To put it friendly, the European Union is not highly enthusiastic to do Georgia and Ukraine. No, no, I don't believe the European Union is kind of a much more functional thing than it looks like. Uh, but at the same time, especially in this area, it's much more difficult to get a, uh, to get a kind of policy. So let's make my last kind of a point. And my last point is the following. I'm not so much worried about the reset policy. I do believe there was need to try something. There was need to try something. The previous status quo also was not working. What I'm afraid is that we do not know what is the reserve <coughs> option? How the US is going to work if the reset is not going to reset the relations? Which are the red lines which are going to be reinforced? If they're going to be red lines that we know that it's going to be reinforced, I do believe that reset should be started. So, from Bulgarians, not more. Thank you well, very much. Short. <coughs> <laughs> very interesting. Uh, <coughs> Gorbachev analogy is very thought-provoking. Um, well, I have questions, but I know a lot of people here do too, and we have little time. So if there are questions, raise your hand. Please identify yourself and keep the question as brief as possible. I'm Stanley Cover with the Cato Institute. How would you assess the balance of power between the United States and Russia and if you could compare it to, say, 10, 15 years ago. Anyone in particular here? I, I know where I was supposed to be at, but I can ask. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, well, I think Ivan's point is actually a very important one. I think he's right that, that uh, in the Kremlin there is this conviction, as apparently there is in the National Intelligence Council as well, uh, that the United States is you know, locked into um, you know, a, a 
absolute decline. I mean, the, the National Intelligence Council's uh, uh, Global Trends 2025 report that came out uh, last uh, November uh, suggests that, although I would point out that four years ago, the mapping, the Global Future 2020 report came out of the NIC saying that we were gonna be operating in a condition of unipolarity as far as the eye could see. So these, these kinds of judgments can, can shift. Uh, I'm actually rather struck by the strength and resilience of the United States um, and uh, you know, many of the weaknesses of uh, Russia that um, you know, Vice President um, you know, Biden proving the iron law of gas um, commented on uh, a few weeks ago. So in, in terms of the balance of, overall balance of power, I suspect uh, when, uh, when all is said and done uh, with the global uh, economic downturn stand, uh, I expect because of uh, just one factor, which is that if you look at American history, the kind of, uh, the, you know, the red thread that runs throughout it is a uh, deep-seated American fear of concentrated political and economic power. Uh, and I think you see that resurfacing uh, in the American body politic today. And, and so I think uh, when we come out of this, whatever set of policies uh, are adopted, the United States will have, relatively speaking, a smaller state sector, uh, more scope for competition, and therefore uh, more innovation that will continue to drive uh, American economic success into the future. Um, Russia, I think, because of many of the things that Lilia has uh, described, uh, will have um, uh, underinvestment, uh, lack of diversification, um, and uh, shrinking um, shrinking conventional combat power because uh, the demographic decline that Russia is uh, embarked on is uh, deep and very difficult to come out of. Uh, Pro-natalist policies historically have never worked very well. President Putin knows this. He referred to it a couple of years ago in his Poslania to the Duma. Um, and we know that in the middle of the next decade, uh, Russia will have about 650,000 18-year-olds in its cohort only a very small number of whom will be eligible for military service because of various neurological and educational deficits because of fetal alcohol syndrome and other things. So Russia's you know, conventional military power is shrinking. Uh, its economic power has been artificially floated by high energy prices. I mean, I think uh, the United States is in much better shape than a lot of the naysayers uh, say. Are we going to be uh, as dominant as we were in the 90s? I doubt it. I think we're going to have more regional uh, contenders for power. But by the middle of the century, I wouldn't expect Russia to be one of those just on demographic uh, uh, grounds alone. Yes, back there. Michael Walsh, Forum One Communications. So one of the things I find fascinating when we talk about U.S.-Russian relations is the emphasis of the U.S. being too weak to continue to, to focus on multiple fronts. And we need to concede certain things to move forward. And that's what you hear a lot of people talking about uh, in different circles. And one of the justifications for, for what just happened in, in Poland and the Czech Republic. One of the things we don't hear so often is, is Russia strong enough to continue to put so much of its foreign policy emphasis on the United States. You just pointed out the fact that its conventional military might is declining. And one of its neighbors is China. And there's obviously strategic implications there. And it has a number of other strategic implications with its neighbors. What is that, how does that play into the whole foreign policy considerations of Russia moving forward? Will it continue to focus as much in the United States? And will it be able to do so and continue to maintain stability at home? Well, it seems to me that the United States continue to be one of the most important points of reference for the Russian political elite until they start to think about Russia in normal terms. So far, the great power status, as my colleagues and Ivan have mentioned, continues to be one of the most important factors of consolidation of the system. But uh, uh, not only the United States, uh, Russia is looking at the neighbor, so this is the second point of interest. Ukraine, Georgia, etc., but Russian political elite is looking at the neighbors only as, as areas of privileged interest, which only supports its you know, still existing post-neo-imperial paradigm. How long it will continue 
Well, Eric um, apparently is smooth enough uh, to announce that, well, Russia can sort it out with the crisis, with the current economic crisis. The problem is that jury, jury is out on the question how resilient Russian system will be, well, in five, six, seven years from now. And we are thinking among our political class and within our intellectual, uh, intellectual establishment, we are thinking also about the question, about the question whether Russia is sustainable in 50 years, 25 years from now, in the current geographical format. If Russia uh, fails to modernize itself, and I can quote President Dmitry Medvedev, who in fact, in a different form, is raising the same question. Yeah, uh, just one thing that you can find interesting. Uh, some probably two years ago, a study has been done, a kind of the internal survey among the representatives of the Russian federal and regional elites, which are the major threats that they identify. And it was an open question. Number one came demography. Number two, energy dependency. Number three, corruptions. Number four, ethnic separatism. By the way, very serious. Number eight, Chinese illegal immigration. Number 22, NATO enlargement. Uh, uh, I'm saying this because one of the reasons uh, basically Russia is so much focused also on the West is that there are two types of threats they don't know how to frame and how to deal with. One is Islam and basically what is happening in the Northern Caucasus. One year after the uh, war in Georgia, basically the Talibanization of the Northern Caucasus is the term used by some of the Russian analysts. And the other, of course, is the relations with China. Mr. Putin has made a quote which I do believe very much explains some of the major dilemma of the Russia state building. He said, Russia either is going to be a great power or it's not going to be at all. Keeping the territorial integrity of this very diverse place with these big natural resources is not a simple thing. And I do believe that there are always going to be a clash between the objectives of the state building and the objectives of the modernization of the Russian economy. So this is why I don't believe in simply personalities. There is a major structural problem that Russia is facing. And part, in my view, of the successful Western policy is going to be to navigate them to take the decisions from which the global system as a whole is going to benefit. We're past time. Can we go one or two more questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Steve, Stephen Morris, Johns Hopkins Science. Uh, one of the assumptions of both the Bush and the Obama administration has been that um, there's a chance that Russia will help us contain Iran. But I have heard it said by other Ru analysts of Russia that Russian perception of Iran is based on the assumption that its the main Islamic threat comes from radical Sunni extremism and that uh, Iran is potentially an ally in the struggle against radical Sunni extremism. Now, this perception may be wrong because, as we all know, Iran is supporting radical Sunni extremism in the form of Hamas and through Syria in the uh, jihadis going into Iraq and in the arming of uh, jihadis in Afghanistan. They are playing everybody against us. But this is not the point whether it's realistic. Do, the, do you believe that the Russians perceive Iran as an ally against Sunni extremism? Because if that's the case, then we have no chance of getting any cooperation. Do the Russians see Iran as a threat? Well, uh, uh, the, short na uh, the short answer would be yes. Russian political elites do not consider, firstly, Iran as a formidable threat, secondly, even as a regional threat so far, and so far, Iran has been very loyal and very friendly to Russia, especially uh, when the situation was sour in the Northern Caucasus, and Iran has helped Russia, even in Tajikistan and Central Asia. However, there are no embraces, no good emotions between Moscow and Tehran. There is suspicion that is growing on within the Russian political elite, but the suspicion does not make still Iran one of the major enemies or really seriously a threat. Last, last question. More Russia questions to Azerbaijan Americans for democracy. Uh, my question is to Ms. Shevtsova, in terms of uh, being a recipe for Russian policy success, helping newly democratic Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova to succeed as viable states, how important it would be to encourage similar transformations
for our Russian neighbors or post-Soviet countries in terms of U.S. engagement there? I agree. If you are thinking about Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the rest, I agree. Well, that was very short. Let's take the lady at the back, <laughs> and we'll stop then. The one to be short. Yes. <laughs> That was well done. Um, hello, thank you for coming. Could you, are we on? Could you allow it? Are we on? Yeah. Testing, testing. Uh, my name is Maketa, and uh, I am a graduate student at the Master's of International Administration. And uh, as I said before, I am from Czech Republic. And my question is to Ivan. Um, the reason, from my personal view, the reason the um, um, the resistance to the radar in Czech Republic, where the public opinion is split 49-51 or 50-50, however you look at it, the reason for the opposition is that there is absolute lack of information. So the 50% of population who is resisting the radar are supported by, guess who? The communists and the socialists. So which this kind of leads very nicely to the Russians because they are only happy for it. So how would you know seeing it now, like from my point of view, how would you then see the cancellation of the radar uh, from that point of view? I'm sorry, am I making myself clear? Yeah, yeah. It sounded better in my head, so I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, first of all, concerning the Czech public opinion, I'm sure that you know much more than me. This is not simply a compliment. I'm not, uh, I'm not following so closely. But there is a group of... Uh, I just want to try to put yourself in the shoes of politicians like Sasha Vondra or people in Poland that decided to defend in front of their publics and also in front of their West European colleagues the decisions for the system. Why? Because West Europeans has two very strong arguments. The first was, why not through NATO? And you know, after 2003 and after all this new old Europe stuff, I do believe the Czech Republic and Poland, and you know, there was kind of bitter experience on our side with this. We were not interested anymore to play in Europe against old Europe. So for these politicians, it was difficult on two fronts. First, domestic, electorally, and second, with respect to the European Union. So these politicians decided to do it under one important assumption. And the assumption was, NATO guarantees look not as strong as they did in 1990s. Look at Georgia and all this stuff. So we want American equipment and American troops on the ground and this type of unilateral guarantees are going to be stronger. At least I know much better Poland than the Czech Republic. <coughs> this was what the Polish reasoning goes. And now they're getting a kind of a very strong message. The first is you're not taken seriously because you're not consulted. I'm once again repeating, if this whole decision was orchestrated in a different way, it would be very different. Because at the end of the day, the Poles got what they wanted, Patriot system. And they didn't get what they didn't want. And this was basically the missiles. But all this message of weakness, symbolic insignificance of the Central Europe, and this mixed with the fact that on September 1st, the anniversary of the beginning of the World War One, World War Two. Sorry, uh, Mr. Putin went to Poland, but not a high-level American officials from the Polish perspective was there. For them, was a very strong signal that America is not a full-time European power anymore. This is the problem. And now, Central Europeans, but not only Central Europeans, but West Europeans, asking a very simple question, strategic one: How a post-American Europe looks like? And one of the answers come yesterday, there was an interview with the Foreign Minister of Poland, Radek Sikorski, who said, we should concentrate much more on the European Union. Not because European Union is more efficient than the United States, but because European Union is in Europe. And I do believe this is going to be one of the unintended consequences of all this drama. Fred, can I just add one comment? Um, <clears throat> you know, on the question of the deployment of uh, U.S. military capabilities into Europe. Uh, my experience um, and my historical memory is that this is rarely a popular thing, uh, you know, in in the host country. Um, there was tremendous, uh, you know, pressure and opposition to the Glickham and Pershing deployments uh, at the end of the 70s and in early 80s in in the host countries uh, and elsewhere in in NATO and in Europe. 
um, there was tremendous opposition in Europe to the idea of the, of the neutron uh, bomb. And I guess one of the things that I find most troubling about the decision the administration took last week is uh, when you think about the reversal on the neutron bomb, for instance, which uh, was taken with the understanding that it was going to relieve pressure on European governments and uh, bring lots of approbation from uh, Europeans who would be much happier not having to host a bomb that was the perfect capitalist weapon that killed people but didn't destroy buildings. The result was not that at all. It was a, a very broad questioning of America's um, a willingness to stand by its commitments, willingness to follow through on decisions that it had, had taken. Um, the glickham pershing decisions, which were pursued despite uh, all the opposition, had a, you know, had a happier ending. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the, uh, the difficulty, and, and, I, and I agree with much of what you said, Ivan, but for, in particular, in the Czech Republic, where uh, Prime Minister Topolanek and Sasha Vandra also had, I think, a very sophisticated understanding of the importance of maintaining that transatlantic link in defense that those people have been essentially uh, betrayed. And while the administration is saying that its consultations with the Czech government have gone very well, nobody should forget that that is a set of consultations that's gone on with a, uh, a technocratic, non-political government, not with the politicians who made the decision, who someday will be back in government and will have long memories. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, Lillian. Very interesting.